Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual book talk on Last Mission to Tokyo, the extraordinary story of the Doolittle Raiders and their final flight, with author Michel Paradis and Jack Goldsmith. Before we hear from our special guests, I want to tell you about two upcoming programs that you can see on the National Archives YouTube channel. On Thursday, October 22nd at 1 p.m., we'll present a panel discussion on the 100th anniversary of women winning the vote, reflections on the 2020 centennial. Panelists will include former Senator from Maryland, Barbara Mikulski, Kay Coles James, President of the Heritage Foundation, Colleen Shogan, Senior Vice President of the White House Historical Association, and Susan Combs, former Assistant Secretary, U.S. Department of the Interior. This program is presented in partnership with the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and the 2020 Women's Vote Centennial Initiative. And on Wednesday, October 26th at noon, data scientist Anthony Whitby will speak on his recent book, The Sum of the People, How the Census Has Shaped Nations from the Ancient World to the Modern Age. I hope you will join us for these programs. In 1942, five months after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle led 80 young men on a seemingly impossible mission across the Pacific to strike the mainland of Japan. In Last Mission to Tokyo, scholar and lawyer Michel Paradis recounts the dramatic aftermath of the Doolittle mission, which involved two lost crews captured, tried, and tortured at the hands of the Japanese. The dramatic rescue of the survivors in the last weeks of the war and the international manhunt and the war crimes trial that followed. Michel Paradis is a leading scholar and lawyer of international law and human rights. He's won high profile cases in courts around the globe and worked for over a decade with the U.S. Department of Defense Military Commission's Defense Organization, where he led many of the landmark court cases to arise out of Guantanamo Bay. He's also a lecturer at the Columbia Law School, where he teaches on the military, the Constitution, and the law of war. He's appeared on or written for NPR, MSNBC, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, and other publications. Joining Michelle Paradis is Jack Goldsmith, the learned hand professor of law at Harvard Law School, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, and co-founder of Lawfare. He teaches and writes about national security law, presidential power, cybersecurity, international law, internal law, foreign relations law, and conflicts of laws. Now let's hear from Michel Paradis and Jack Goldsmith. Thank you for joining us today. So, so Michel, this is, this is an amazing book. It's uh, ostensibly, and it starts off with uh, the Doolittle Raid, which was the famous air raid of, uh, by U.S. soldiers in Japan uh, after Pearl Harbor. Uh, that event is pretty well known, but the after story you tell is, is not terribly well known. And it's, it's so many things wrapped up into one. It's a legal thriller. It's a story about amazing personalities, about uh, revenge and justice. And uh, it's just a great book. Before, before we get to what the book is about, I think it's important because the book is all the much better because of who you are. So I think it's important for you to tell us, you know, what is your relationship to war crimes trials and how did you come to write the book? Sure. Uh, so fairly early on in my legal practice, I got an interest in doing um, international, what's now called international humanitarian law, what sometimes people call the law of war. Um, this was, you know, at the end of the 90s, early aughts. And so things like the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and Rwanda were just up and going. And um, it was kind of amazing to me as, so, as a, a student of history to see uh, war crimes trials and the law of war actually becoming a real kind of law, like something you actually did in court. It wasn't just something academics talked about, it was this thing that happened back in the 1940s. And so I got fascinated with it then um, and, and pursued it. Um, I worked on war crimes and international or human rights cases in a variety of countries, whether it was Sierra Leone or Guatemala. Um, and then uh, what I've probably worked on the most in my career are the Guantanamo military commissions, these uh, ostensible war crimes trials that have been uh, kind of running in fits and starts, but nevertheless running uh, for about the past 15 years in Guantanamo, um, where I've represented a number of people 
uh, at various levels of their prosecutions, whether or not it's the trial or the pretrial uh, on appeal. So to make clear, when you say, when you say you've represented a number of people, you've represented a number of alleged terrorists who That's are right. defendants who are defendants in these in the military commissions. That's right. Yeah. I, so I, I work, I've worked since two thousand and seven um, in an office that the Department of Defense established, uh, which is now called the Military Commissions Defense Organization. And what that is 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 basically kind of like the public defender for Guantanamo. We get assigned to represent detainees when they're charged before the military commissions. Um, and that's been fascinating, challenging, dispiriting, and rewarding work all uh, at the same time. And so it's been a real privilege. And but that's ultimately what brought me to this uh, this episode that I write about in the book as well. And so, but how did you come to write the book? So, so um, I, mean, I was working. Yeah, no, it's, okay. a, it's a great question, um, and it, it builds exactly off what you were just talking about. Um, so, back in two thousand and seven, there was this ongoing debate that you might remember at the end of the Bush administration: um, is waterboarding torture? Um, and we had heard a rumor about a case from World War II. What we had heard was that we prosecuted the Japanese for water. Uh, and so we sent a young Marine captain out to the National Archives to dig up this case. And she pulled out the record of trial, which I don't think had been seen probably in about at that point, 60 years, um, and brought a copy of it back to us. And I remember one rainy day reading it and first of all, being blown away. It wasn't just about waterboarding. If anything, waterboarding was only a small part of it. Um, but it was also about the Doolittle Raiders, who are these, I mean, again, as a student of history, people I'd certainly known about, whether or not it was Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor or, you know, going to air shows as a kid. Um, and the more and more I read the story, the more and more I was just blown away by not just the human drama, and there's actually just a lot of human drama that you can read um, right off the trial transcript, but also just how much the, you know, the very questions we were confronting in the war on terrorism or the kind of questions you confront in Sierra Leone or Yugoslavia or Rwanda, these war crimes questions uh, come up every time. Um, and it's almost as if no one's ever thought about think, looking back and, and seeing how they were answered before. And so that was just a real shock to me. Um, a lot of the answers that I was reading from this transcript of 1940 were not sitting well, uh, in, in certainly with respect to what the United States was doing in 2007. Um, but it was just a fascinating story. It was, it was something I could relate to immediately just from my, my own personal experience doing these kind of cases. Okay, so tell us about the Doodle Little Raid, how it came about, what it was. Yeah, so the, the Doodle Raid, for people who don't know, um, is, is probably the single most heroic and celebrated moment of the Second World War, at least for the people who lived through it. Um, you know, 1942, the war is going badly. Um, the Allies are on the retreat or on the defensive, whether or not it's in North Africa, uh, in Russia, um, in the Pacific, the Japanese have not only pushed um, the Allies out of their colonial possessions in China, um, they've taken uh, the Philippines, which is the largest American colony at the time, uh, the Bataan Death March is underway, Japan is actively bombing Australia, and there is this overwhelming feeling, certainly in the United States, that this is a war that we might lose, right? There, the United States is not taking any offensive action with the exception of some naval operations. Uh, everything else is purely defensive and, and not going well at that. And um, so Roosevelt, in a sense, just needs a good news story um, and gets hears about this idea that we can take bombers off of an aircraft carrier to attack Japan. Um, the problem with this proposal though, um, you know, and this is as early as January of 1942, the problem with this proposal is that it's actually technically impossible. Uh, there is simply no technical means by which to do this. Uh, but the head of the Army Air Forces at the time, Hap Arnold, taps uh, an aide who had come onto his staff, a, a stunt pilot by the name of Jimmy Doolittle, um, who was not a career military officer. Uh, he had served in World War I, but spent most of his career essentially as a, a, a stunt pilot. Uh, he was the first American to ever fly across the United States in a single day. Um, he, he would do these insane acrobatic stunts like flying while painting the, um, the windows of his plane black so he could fly blind. I uh, ended up doing that on Long Island, flying 14 miles in a circle overhead and then landing uh, right from where he had taken off. Um, and so he was this kind of person who just had this aura of being able to do the impossible. And so he gets this impossible task. And what most people don't know about Doolittle, at least, or at least is sort of in the back of his reputation at the time, is he also has a PhD from MIT in aer what we would now call aeronautical engineering. Um, he, you know, these crazy stunts are actually scientific experiments uh, on Doolittle's part. And so when he gets this problem, he sees it as an engineering problem and kind of sticking to it with that a sense of American ingenuity. He basically 
figures out how to turn these B-25, these fat B-25 army bombers into flying gas cans uh, so that they can take off from an aircraft carrier with enough fuel to be able to bomb Japan. Um, and then they have to land them somewhere. And the only option really is China. Um, and, and China is you know, deeply contested territory at this part. The, the Japan um, is occupying large swaths of China. There are plenty of factions within the Chinese government at the time that are loyal to Japan. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek is our nominal ally uh, and Mao Zedong is our sort of enemy's enemy's friend. Uh, but these are by no means, this is by no means safe territory. Um, and, and so everyone kind of assumes it's a one-way mission um, and that it might be a suicide mission. Um, and so, but they do it anyway. Uh, they take off from an aircraft carrier on April 18th, 1942, uh, run bombing raids over Tokyo, Nagoya, and Kobe, um, fly on to China, and not a single plane is shot down. Uh, one ends up having to land in the Soviet Union, which causes a bit of a diplomatic incident. But all of the 15 other planes make it to China, or at least to the, off the coast of China. Um, and then of those, all but 11 of Doolittle's men ultimately were returned home to safety. Um, three are killed in various plane crashes. Um, but all of the rest, 80 men in total, um, for, who Doolittle takes on this mission, um, all but 11 of them uh, live, to see, live to go home. Um, and so it's this miraculous moment in 1942, right? The darkest days of World War II. You have this miraculous operation where not only were we able to essentially strike back for Pearl Harbor, um, and there was a huge public appetite for that, as you can imagine, um, but we did it with minimal loss of American life and in what became just a resounding success. And so it was, it just filled the newspapers for days and days, newsreels for days and days, uh, celebrating uh, the success of the Doolittle Raid. But it wasn't uh, a total success in the sense that not everybody made it back. And That's so right. could tell us about the people that didn't make it back. And was that known at the time? Were they presumed dead or were they, did they, was their fate publicly known in America? So the initial, so initially um, the War Department said everyone made it home safely, uh, with the exception of this one plane that landed up in the Soviet Union. And that, and that was a lie. Everyone knew that was a lie. Um, because there were eight. Americans uh, from two of the planes that Doolittle took off the aircraft carrier USS Hornet, um, who soon were captured by guerrillas uh, sympathetic to the Japanese and then turned over to the Japanese occupying uh, Shanghai and then Nanjing. Um, they're taken into the custody of the Kempei Tai, uh, which is Japan's basically secret police clandestine service operating in, in China, um, and subjected to really just shocking forms of torture and abuse. Um, you know, when, when I mentioned at the beginning, we had initially heard this was a case about waterboarding, and that's true. Um, the Japanese subjected the Doolittle Raiders to waterboarding, uh, to sleep deprivation, to sl uh, uh, stress positions. They used to hang them from their hands overnight. They interrogated them day after day. On um, one occasion, one of the stories I used to, one, one of the Doolittle Raiders who I, who I kind of use as the focal point to try and tell some of these stories, a, a Utah by the name of Chase Nielsen, um, who is dragged into an interrogation room in Shanghai, pinned to the floor with a broom handle behind his knees, and they stomp on his knees to essentially lever the knee joints apart. Um, and, you know, so the, the, just the raw brutality uh, that the Doolittle Raiders face when they're first captured by the Kempe Thai is, you know, shocking, um, shocking even today. Um, but then they're taken back to Tokyo. Um, where they're held in solitary confinement and, you know, there's- Sorry, how, how, many, how many of them were there? Oh, there were eight, altogether there were right. eight. Right, okay, good, right. So from two of the planes, uh, eight of them get, get captured um, and they get taken to Tokyo and then there's this real question inside the Japanese government, like, wh what do we do with these people? Um, you know, you have the doves, like people like uh, Foreign Minister Shigenogori Togo um, saying, you know, we've agreed to comply with the Geneva Conventions. We have to treat them as prisoners of war. Uh, but then you have hardliners, uh, people like uh, Hajime Sugiyama, who's the chief of staff of the army, saying, let's execute them. Let's do it as publicly and spectacularly as possible to make sure nothing like this ever happens again. Um, and, you know, it's a real, there's a real division inside the Japanese government about what do we do with these guys? Now, now that we've caught these essentially most notorious Americans, uh, what do we do with them? And I would have thought that, you know, especially the brutal way that they were treated upon capture, uh, I think the expectation would have been that they would just be summar summarily killed after they, whatever information was got was extracted from them, but that didn't happen. Yeah, that didn't happen. It was a, it was a real that was a real fascinating um, part of the book to research for me uh, because again I you know I came at this you know with all the traditional American 
assumptions and prejudices about the Second World War. You know, the, the Japanese are essentially the Asian Nazis. And, um, and so like thinking about, like I, I was like, oh, they didn't just execute them. Like I expected them to be tortured, but the idea that not only uh, weren't they summarily executed, there was this real divisive debate over what to do with them. And, and it was interesting to see Japan through that lens, like to try and understand how this was all received in Japan, because there was this real tension between what had been in, in Japan, essentially 60, 70 year uh, in light period of enlightenment uh, called the Meiji Restoration, where Japan really becomes one of the most liberal countries in the entire world. Um, and they're, they're the first country to sign the 1929 Geneva Conventions, um, although they don't ratify it. Um, and they don't ratify it primarily because there's this simultaneous cultural political lurch in the 1930s um, from a very hardline militarist faction. And there's this really, they just become extremely politically polarized society where you have primarily uh, an urban professional elite on one side who is, has profited immensely from this liberalization, from the modernity that Japan was enjoying for the past 70 years. Um, but then the kind of agrarian traditional, um, you know, parts of the society that overwhelmingly formed the power base of the army, um, you know, wanted to return Japan to kind of a prior samurai glory, this imagined past where Japan was truly great. And they fought bitterly over the 1930s. There's a coup in 1936 where the prime minister is only not killed because the assassins mistake his, his brother uh, for him. Um, and Japan's politics becomes extremely unstable. And this is still true throughout the war, uh, which is, was one of the most fascinating sort of things for me to research as someone who didn't come to this as a Japan historian. Um, and all of these tensions, all of, these, all of this division over what kind of country Japan should be comes to probably one of its most violent heads around the Dubo Raiders. Um, and what ultimately happens is uh, um, Prime Minister and slash War Minister Toga, uh, Tojo, uh, Hideki Tojo, um, he needs to kind of come up with a compromise. Uh, I always try to, I kind of analogize him to John Boehner for people, like this boring sort of bureaucrat politician whose primary job is to just keep everyone from killing, killing each other. Um, and so he goes to the War Ministry and he says, we need to find a legal way to kill the Doolittle Raiders. Uh, and the lawyers in the War Ministry come back with, you know, the answer, that's obvious, which is, no, you can't do that. That's completely illegal. International law forbids the murder of prisoners. Um, but then the message gets sent back down to the lawyers. They're like, no, 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 you don't understand. We, we have to find a way to kill these guys. And if we don't, the Kempe Tai is going to do it. They're going to claim it was an accident. No one's going to believe that. It's going to be a diplomatic crisis. Um, and so what the lawyers come up with is they say, well, uh, if we try the deliterators as war criminals, uh, we can sentence them to death and then execute them. Um, and now there are problems with that. For one, they don't have a law authorizing this. They end up having to enact an ex post facto law to essentially authorize the prosecution of the dual raiders as war criminals. Um, and so that's into, that ends up being what they did. Uh, in August of 1942, uh, the Japanese in Shanghai conduct a war crimes trial of the dual raiders um, on essentially trumped up charges of attacking Japanese civilians. Um, they're all convicted. Uh, the primary evidence against them, as you might expect, is the confessions they gave under torture. Um, or at least just to be clear, just to be clear, you should explain. So they were charged with killing civilians, and we you spoke earlier about the raid. So you should the raid they tried is they tried to hit military targets. That's right. So their direction. So so their directions. Um, they had two types of weapons. They had uh, three types of weapons technically. So they had incendiary bombs. They had demolition bombs and they had guns. And uh, Doolittle was adamant uh, in the selection of the bombing targets that only clear military objectives be targeted. There was actually an episode on the, as they were planning this operation on the deck of the Hornet, where the pilots all drew cards to see, to see who got to bomb the Imperial Palace. Um, and Doolittle was like, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. That's, uh, you know, we don't want to give the Japanese an excuse uh, to say that we did something wrong. Um, and so the target selection was very, done very carefully. The problems, though, um, arose with uh, primarily with the incendiary bombs. Um, you know, incendiary bombs. I remember I I interviewed uh, Doolittle's co-pilot uh, in researching this book, and I asked him. I was like, um, you know, tell me about the bombing. He's like, well, we had demolition bombs. We knew where to put those. But then he's like, but the incendiary bombs. They're like it's like a softball. You just like throw it out the window, right? 
And so, you know, there was, you can't accurately fire or drop an incendiary pipe. They're, they're, it's just like firing a shotgun. Um, and so there was a lot of damage to civilian areas. Um, whether or not that could be construed as collateral damage or justifiable right. damage, that's, that's a different question. And um, in fact, well, yeah. I mean, we don't need to go too far down this line, but you're, even that very question was hard to answer then because the nature of the, the precision of the laws of war and what it prohibited and the precision of the weapons was much different than today. So it's kind of even a little bit of anachronism to even really judge it through that standard. But getting, but yeah, yeah. correct, yeah. But getting back to the trial, so they, it was basically a show trial? Uh, it wasn't basically, it was a show trial. Yeah. Uh, you know, the whole thing lasted about an hour. Um, yeah. and, that, and that's the longest estimate um, I found in any of the documents was people said it ran about an hour. Um, the, you know, the primary evidence against them, as I mentioned before, was these confessions uh, that they had given to the Kempe Tai. And when you read the confessions, they're almost like comical in how guilty they claim to be. You know, in the, you know, we were flying, everything was fine, but then we started getting fierce resistance from the brave Japanese army. And so we said, damn the Japs and decided to gun the school, right? And so there are these almost preposterously um, inculpatory statements. Um, but that becomes the evidence uh, that, that's ultimately used against them. They're all convicted, they're all sentenced to death, which is the only permissible punishment under this ex post facto law. Um, the case is returns to Tokyo, uh, where the emperor ultimately decides uh, to commute the sentences of three uh, of five of them, excuse me, uh, and go forward with the death penalty against the two pilots and one of the gunners uh, uh, who was captured. Uh, the rest are sentenced to life imprisonment with special conditions, was the, was the euphemism. Um, that basically meant solitary confinement. One dies of um, essentially a malnutrition disease called beriberi. Um, another is on the verge of death uh, in August of 1945, but none of that is actually known. Um, you know, to your question before, you know, the Japanese, after they carry out the sentences, they issue essentially a press release saying that the dual raiders have been sternly punished. And it just becomes common knowledge in the United States that the eight do lost dual raiders um, are essentially martyrs to the hated Japanese. There's, there's even a movie about it, um, the, a Hollywood movie, 1944, where they ima which is essentially a courtroom drama, uh, where they imagine the trial of the dual raiders. Um, and it's actually a much fairer trial <laughs> than the one they actually got. They get a lawyer that goes on for days, their witnesses called, um, and the truth was nothing like that. The truth was far more summary than that. Which leads to, so that was what the world thought in the, in the West. And then comes Operation Magpie, I think. Yeah, Operation Magpie. Um, so the Office of Strategic Services, um, the forerunner of the CIA, um, quickly converts from doing commando operations in China and the Pacific generally, but in China, um, to doing rescue operations. Literally the day after the bombs are dropped on Nagasaki, the bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. Uh, they get the new missions, they're all named after birds. And one commando team is essentially dropped at a POW camp one or two days after the war is over under what's called Operation Magpie. And they, it's late in the afternoon, they're, they're approaching this camp and all of a sudden they take fire uh, from the camp and they all hit the dirt. And this lieutenant, this Japanese lieutenant comes out with his men, arrests all of them and basically says, who, what, are you guys crazy? What, no, no one knows the war is over. Like, the, had, you dropped any, had you dropped into our camp any later, you would have just been shot on sight because the officers would have been in bed. All the enlisted think the war is still going. Um, but nevertheless, over the next couple of days, they liberate this prisoner of war camp um, in, outside of Beijing. They put all about 500 POWs up in the, the Grand Hotel de Wagon Lee, which is this uh, converted geisha house uh, in Beijing, which becomes this massive rat party, basically. Uh, for all these liberated prisoners of war. Um, and then a rumor starts circulating that the Dulu Raiders had been getting held at Feng Tai, Feng Feng Prison, which is, um, which is the one outside of Beijing, but no one can find them, right? They're, they're not among the prisoners. Uh, but it turns out in secret, there's a secret, essentially, uh, portion of the prison, of the prison camp, uh, in which four of the Dulu Raiders are being held. And um, the way one of them, Chase Nielsen, uh, who I mentioned before, described it as he kind of comes out they freshly shave them, you know, down to the scalp. Uh, they put them in these overbilling uniforms because they're all basically 100 pounds at this point. And he walks out and he sees this American who has this like stern look on his face and all sun weathered. And the American asks him his name. He's like, I'm Chase Nielsen, I was a dual raider. The American kind of looks back and says, watch out for this guy, he's insane. Uh, because everyone assumes they're dead, right? This is, this is Lazarus coming back from the dead. Um, but it's true, right? There, there they are. Um, there's this kind of miraculous moment um, this really optimistic moment uh, at the end of August 1940, uh, end of August 1945, 
where again, all the, the Dula Raid is back in the newspapers uh, because the Dula Raiders, at least some of them, uh, had turned up alive and safe and are on their way home. So then the Americans decide to have a trial. Yeah, so, so that, that, that same sort of spirit of, uh, how do you say, sort of good feeling, um, it kind of also mixes with this real hard current for revenge um, that's, that exists. You know, if you look into the, certainly into the newspapers from 1945, um, the end of 1945, it's almost a litany of Japanese atrocities, um, day after day, you know, all around the world, prisoners are recounting their stories after being liberated. Um, new documents and new, you know, uh, and, and sort of new atrocities are being discovered every day, not just in Japan, but also uh, obviously in Europe. And um, the Doodler Raiders become kind of one of the, one of the uh, sort of major examples of this. Um, what, on their way home, they basically stop over at the U.S. headquarters in China um, and sit down with a judge advocate by the name of Ham Young, who is the top lawyer in China and had just created only a few months earlier, the China War Crimes Office. Uh, because there's this idea that takes root um, in late 1945 that we're gonna start having war crimes trials. Um, it had been kind of this academic idea. Um, you know, you have people like Hans Kelsen sort of writing justice through law and all these good things um, in the early part of the war. But to the extent any trials had gone forward, it's things like ex parte hearing, right? Which are not, a special models of due process fairness. You should explain what that is. That also took place in 1942, I think. That's right. right. The same year as the Doolittle Raid. And actually, uh, possibly, you know, I mean, I could never, I could never draw 100% of a link, but but seemed to have some effect on the Japanese. And so, um, you know, the, so you should explain. You should explain what what the Kieran case was about because it it has some parallels. Yeah, it does. Um, so in um, in June of 1942. Uh, some Nazi saboteurs come ashore in Long Island and in Florida. They're, they essentially sail on from a submarine um, with instructions to uh, commit sabotage against industrial targets inside of the United States. Um, one of them defects almost immediately and turns everybody else in. And there is initially an effort to try them for espionage uh, in federal court, but the defector is, is basically a lunatic um, as you know, a Nazi defector it's probably likely to be. Um, and so this plan develops um, to try them in military commissions inside the United States. Now, military commissions have a checkered history in the United States. Um, they were used previous to 1942. The last time they'd been used was in the Philippines uh, to go after Philippine insurgents during the Spanish-American War in the period of the U.S. occupation of the Philippines immediately after. Um, they had been used to some extent during the Mexican War and the Civil War. Um, but what they really offered um, for not only FDR, but J. Edgar Hoover, uh, who had a real strong interest in, in keeping a lid on the fact that the Nazi, Nazis had actually turned themselves in, that they weren't just discovered. Yeah, he was claiming that he discovered them and stopped the great infiltration, when in fact, he didn't know, even know they were there. Right, well, actually, not even, it's not even that. So the main, um, the main guy, a guy named um, Dosh, George Dosh, uh, is this kind of total lunatic. Uh, who's, the, who's the head of the Nazi saboteur party, um, he gets spooked on the beach because they run into a coxswain and they escape, but they don't, you know, but he thinks the jig is up. And so he ends up calling the FBI office in New York and saying, hi, I'm a Nazi saboteur. I arrived on a submarine over the weekend. I'd like to turn myself in. And the guy on the other li li <laughs> other end of the line is like, okay. And then files a report in the nut folder. Um, so like if you go to the folder uh, where, where George Dosh's original report is included, there's also one of... Uh, Hitler's uh, ice skating in Rockefeller Center and other similar, <laughs> similar conspiracies being on right. Um He ultimately has to go to Washington in person and he walks into uh, the office of a guy named Mickey Ladd, who's like a deputy, deputy, deputy under J. Edgar Hoover. And he says, look, I'm a Nazi, I'm a Nazi senator. I'm trying to turn, you know, I want to turn myself in. There are others amongst us. He kept getting put off by one secretary after another until he gets into Mickey Ladd's office and then he opens up a briefcase and dumps out $60,000, which is about like almost a million dollars today in cash. And the way it's sort of described by Mickey Ladd is like he looks down at the cash and looks over at the door and says, lock the door. <laughs> because, you know, that's, that's ultimately three how these Nazis get caught. Um, and so, yeah, there's a real desire to have secrecy. Because Hoover does not want it to be known. And FDR doesn't want it to be known. That it's this easy to infiltrate the United States um, and that we can do this flat -footed. So. They conduct this military commission in secret. It's um, 
by no means a model of American justice. And the lawyers, uh, the military lawyers representing the Nazis, assigned to represent the Nazis, ultimately take the case all the way to the Supreme Court, challenging it as essentially fundamentally unlawful um, for a variety of different sort of technical legal reasons, um, including its fairness. And this hits the papers in a big way all around the world, and uh, including in Japan. And so as they're getting ready to prosecute the Doolittle Raiders, this is July of 1940, this is the same exact time, as they're getting ready to prosecute the Doolittle Raiders, all of a sudden everything stops uh, at the end of July. And everyone's, like, everyone just gets an order, stand down. Uh, and so everything goes on pause. And then a couple, about a week later, the Supreme Court issues a decision upholding the prosecution of the Nazi saboteurs. They're executed a few days after that. And then the order comes down, okay, proceed with the Doolittle Raiders. Um, so there's this real clear um, sort of interplay. There's, a, there's clear signs of real interaction. Unfortunately, a lot of Japanese documents got destroyed. So I was never able to find it. So, so that connection is amazing, as is, and we don't have to go down this path, but the Kieran precedent and the precedent and the Roosevelt order for that military commission ended up being the precedent and basis for the original order that created the military commissions that you're now representing defendants in. But maybe we'll get back to that in the end. Let's go back to the end of the trial. Um, sorry, let's go back to the American trial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, uh, the American trial of those responsible for well, who, who were who was the trial against? So, so this was like a big problem, actually. Yeah. Um, because who do you blame? Who do you blame? Right when you have so many people who you could try, you could go all the way down to like the Kempe Tai guys who were carrying out the torture. You could go all the way up to Hirohito, who was clearly you know personally involved in choosing who lives and who dies. Um, and this is a big deal because one of the first essentially promises that. Um, you know, for war crimes trials um, comes from Roosevelt in connection with the Doolittle case. In 1943, when Roosevelt reveals the uh, fate of the Doolittle Raiders to the country, um, there's this real strong outcry to, you know, for revenge. It's probably one of the most galvanizing moments um, in, in sort of like American hostility towards the Japanese since Pearl Harbor. And you have congressmen actively saying, we're no longer going to take Japanese prisoners because of what was done to the Doolittle Raiders. And you have Roosevelt and the War Department saying, no, 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 <laughs> let's, let's calm this down. We've, we're upholding certain values here. And Roosevelt gives this speech where he says, and do not worry, we're going to hold the people who perpetrated this atrocity personally responsible. Um, it's not all the Japanese, it's the people, it's the individual criminals. Um, and this is early 1943, right? This is not a time when using trials to, you know, to prosecute the enemy's uh, access powers was really high on anyone's priority list. Um, and just to give you one kind of example of that, uh, Churchill writes about the Tehran conference at the end of 1943, when Roosevelt, Churchill, and, and Stalin meet for the very first time, and there's discussion about what to do with the Nazis once we've captured them. And at least according to Churchill, there's some dispute about the authenticity of this, but at least according to Churchill, Stalin sort of casually proposes, well, why don't we just create a list of 50,000 top Nazis and then execute them on site? And uh, FDR is reputedly to have said, well, wouldn't, wouldn't 49,000 be plenty? Like 50 seems too much. Um, and there is this real, you know, and, and in a way, I, I don't mean to be glib about it, but in a way, Stalin's not wrong by historical standards, right? We didn't, we didn't conduct a trial for Napoleon before sending him off to Elba, right? There's a, if you look back to history, what happened prior to World War II, executing your enemies or treating them in some summary ways was certainly not, um, certainly not a controversial thing, quite the opposite, it was the expected thing to do. But Roosevelt and the Roosevelt administration particularly really just pushes, pushes and pushes for this idea of conducting trials. Um, Stalin comes around to that idea and in fact appoints the head of the uh, Moscow purge trials to preside as his judge at Nuremberg, um, but that's that's sort of the current in which all of this comes in 1945. Is that the United States so, essentially assist, insisted on this? And so it's it's so just can you explain Roosevelt in 42? He wants to have a military commission for the Nazi saboteurs because, in lieu of a real criminal trial, and yeah. he wants it not because he's being generous, but because he wants to be able to have a quick trial and dispose of them. By 1943, he's kind of it's not really the opposite argument, but 
He's saying, no, we're going to have a trial instead of immediate execution, which was the other option on the table. So did Roosevelt change or was it just the context different? Um, it's hard, you know, Roosevelt is probably one of the most mercurial politicians in American history, um, for yeah. good and for ill. So it's hard. And, and legally trained as well. <laughs> That's right. Um, and so I think part of it was, you know, the whole episode with the Nazi saboteurs was, at, was controversial at the time. And, um, and I think part of it can at least be written off, at least, so just to give you the context, too, unless you think I'm sort of naive in my appreciation of Roosevelt, like in the context of the Nazi saboteurs case, he actually proposed, half kidding, um, giving them over to Barnum and Bailey Circus so that we could make money off displaying them publicly, right? So, so, so Roosevelt is not a bleeding heart by any, by any right. stretch of imagination. Um, but I think probably for a combination of policy as well as you know, practical reasons, I think Roosevelt understood that you know, there were certain values at stake in the war. Right, that the United States is claim to legitimacy, it's claim to developing allies throughout the world in the cause of the Second World War, which was by no means uh, a foregone conclusion in 1942, 1943, even into 1944, um, depended upon things like the Atlantic Charter, depended on our claiming you know, a certain uh, ability to distinguish ourselves from the Axis powers. And so the idea that war crimes, uh, that we would sort of use our, respect our values, right? Respect our liberal values that we're preaching around the world when dealing with our enemies was in a way a really ostentatious demonstration of that. I think it was a real practical reason for it too. Um, and, and this you can see in plenty of documents, including dealing with the Doolittle Raid um, and, and the public reaction of, to the Doolittle Raid. You know, Roosevelt's happy to foment sort of public outrage and for revenge as much as possible. It helps sell war bonds if nothing else. Um, but there is a, simultaneous concern that this not be directed at the Japanese people, right? Like both in Germany and in Japan, uh, or in Europe, I should say, in Asia, there was this idea that we have to separate the leadership against whom we are at war from the people in the countries, um, you know, fighting that war against us. And that was, that had real important strategic um, uses as well, right? You can't, if you're going to implement something like the Morgenthau plan, which was a, you know, not unlike executing the top 50,000 Nazis, you know, a policy that was put in, proposed in the Treasury Department by FDR's own Treasury Secretary to essentially agrarianize Germany, which would have resulted, you know, by the estimates at the time in half of the German population dying of famine. Um, you're gonna make it really hard to get, convince people to surrender. Um, yeah. If, you know, you can't have a sense, you have to have an, a, a an option for people to give up without either being humiliated or being, you know, murdered, <laughs> essentially. And so this uh, this political decision to draw a distinction between the people we're fighting and the leadership who are going to hold criminally responsible um, had both, I think, real strong values behind it. I'm not saying it was entirely cynical, but it actually made a lot of sense practically as well. And so in this period in 1945, when you when we start having, the, you know, the Doolittle Raiders trial begin to get formulated. And, in the, you know, the first months right after the war, um, it's, uh, it's an expression of, I think, both of these things, right? This promise that we're going to have justice. Um, but I think certainly someone like MacArthur was keenly aware that attributing responsibility, attributing culpability and shame and blame on the leadership of the Japanese or on particular individuals in Japan would give him a far more stable country to try and rebuild um, in Japan, right? Because you still have you know, tens of millions of Japanese people um, who are now a defeated enemy and have to be given a reason to want to cooperate with their American occupiers. Um, yeah. So tell us, um, so, so the trial itself, who do they end up choosing as defendants? What is your assessment of it? So bit, give us a brief summary of what happened. Yeah, sure. So like the, the, the in, one of the interesting things that I spent really, really probably the preponderance of this book on um, is trying to put together how this trial comes together. Because you start, as I said a few minutes ago, you know, with a universe, a completely expansive universe of potential people uh, to, to find culpable for the tor torture and murder of the Doolittle Raiders. Um, and through a lot of sort of fits and starts, as one lawyer, a graduate of Harvard Law School, no less, by the name of Robert Dwyer, um, he gets this assignment, runs himself ragged all over Asia, trying to figure out how to square the circle, and ultimately settles upon the lawyers. <laughs> The lawyers and the judges. Um, he basically sees the Japanese lawyers and judges. Japanese lawyers. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, clear. Yeah. 
Yeah. Jim Niesler is in judges. Uh, he basically sees this show trial in August of 1942 as the, the fulcrum of the entire mistreatment of the Doolittle Raiders, right? It both laundered the torture that had been done to them, uh, but also created the conditions necessary for them to be executed and for them uh, to be held in solitary confinement, to be starved the way they were. Um, and so basically he hunts down the judges and lawyers uh, of the Doolittle Raiders trial, as well as a few military officers associated with that trial. Um, and ultimately decides that they're the ones who bear the most responsibility. They participated the most and have to be the one, are the ones who should answer uh, for the torture and mistreatment of the Doolittle Raiders. Um, and so in 1946, when this trial finally gets underway, it's the, the fourth trial, the fourth war crimes trial to be conducted by the United States in the Pacific. Um, you, you end up having the trial of a trial. Uh, it's a really just kind of remarkable turnabout where you have the United States Army putting essentially their counterparts on trial in a war crimes trial uh, conducted at least under sort of vague rules, um, certainly not the ordinary rules of due process in the United States, um, and litigating in this very both high level and practical way, what is fairness? Like what, what do we owe our enemies? Do, are there standards of international law or basic humanity that we can look to to determine whether or not someone has you know, essentially just engaged in the paperwork for murder or has actually conducted a, a good faith criminal trial? Um, and so it's just, it's like a really just fascinating human drama. I, 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 I've said this a few times, um, you know, to people when they've asked me about this book, like, is it a good story, a happy ending or is it a comedy or is it a tragedy? Um, it's actually, I, I kind of take a lot of heart from this book, um, and from the debate you have, because you have, you know, some American lawyers who get assigned quite unhappily, frankly, to represent the Japanese, but ultimately see it as their duty to represent them, um, you know, to take on the defense function fully. And then you have prosecutors like Robert Dwyer saying, look, there are international standards or values at stake here. Um, and you have them both clash with really just good faith claims um, to what is true, what is just. Um, and it, so it's actually like, a, it, it's especially after, you know, a lot of the politics we live through today, just watching two people uh, in two sides have a good faith debate uh, over something important, as important as values. Um, is just kind of refreshing, <laughs> if nothing else. Yeah, and so what? So what was the outcome of the trial? So the outcome and of the then, trial. And then I want to get. And then I, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So the outcome of the trial was really shocking to everybody. Um, everyone's expecting, not un, not unreasonably, um, for all of these guys to be executed. Um, that that's exactly what happened in the, the previous three war crimes prosecutions that the army had engaged in. In the Pacific, Yamashita um, is the most famous of those, but there were a couple others. Um, and instead, um, they're all convicted, but the charges against them, but then, then they get acquitted essentially of the elements of the charge. Um, and all of them are sentenced to relatively short terms of years. In fact, the only one who gets sentenced longer than five years uh, is, is a sentence of nine years for the one judge on the Google Raiders trial in 1942, who was actually a lawyer. Uh, and because he was a lawyer, the, the court basically said, you should have known better um, and, and gave him the stiffest sentence, but only of nine years. And it was a shock. It was a total shock to the system. Um, you had politicians, letter writing campaigns demanding that the Doolittle Raiders trial be done again so that death sentences could be carried out. And so there is this sort of after story of, you know, these lawyers in China, um, back to Ham Young, the guy who initially sees this case in uh, August of 1945 as, you know, a potentially marquee case of the entire war. Uh, he has to sit down and figure out how to both assuage the public desire for blood um, but also, are, again, our you know, basic conceptions of fairness, due process, things like double jeopardy, um, which kind of forms out, rounds out the end of the book. So, you know, you referred to the human drama of the book, and we just haven't had time to get into that, and we're not going to, but the, the characters are amazing, and the kind of moral struggles in the midst of war, and trying to figure out what's right and just and true, it, and, and there's so many interesting characters along the way, and so... I, I really want to commend you for that, even though we can't really discuss it. Um, so in wrapping up, I want to ask you a couple of implications questions or sure. legacy questions. Um, so what, what is the legacy of this trial, say, both in, I'm just interested in Japan and especially, I mean, you're an expert on international criminal law. This was kind of at the dawn of the modern international criminal tribunal movement. So just tell us what the, how has this trial come to be seen and, and is it seen any differently in light of what you've discovered? Um, so it's a great question. I think there are a couple different legacies that it's, it's had. Um, the most obvious one, in particular because it's like a forgotten trial, 
Um, you know, it didn't end up going to the U.S. Supreme Court. It wasn't controversial like Yamashita was. Um, and so prior to this book, really had not been written about at all. Even in books about the Doolittle Raid, you, there's like this footnote that there was a trial sometime in, in uh, 1946. Um, so there was a, you know, it was a really un, untilled ground when I came to this. Um, but one of the main reasons, I think, is that all the lessons, all the, all the sort of lessons from that fight that I talked about, um, end up becoming the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Um, uh, you know, the prohibition on torture, the rights to, you know, have your prisoner of war status evaluated in a neutral way as early as possible, um, various procedural trial rights that you get, um, you know, the right to have your country supervise any trial of you um, that an enemy might be, as an enemy, um, that might, if you're, if you're being prosecuted, you have the right essentially to representation by your home country. Um, and then most famously, there's actually um, a provision of the Geneva Convention, which ends up becoming really quite important in you know, many, many years later in, in some of the Guantanamo cases, which is called Common Article 3. Um, and Common Article 3 forbids torture, forbids murder, any number of things, but it has a very peculiar provision that uh, forbids the carrying out of sentences except upon the regular trial, uh, except upon a trial by a regularly constituted court affording all the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable people. And uh, as, as indispensable by civilized people, and, and that's actually, in a sense, what this whole dual raid trial is about, is, is what are the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable by civilized people. So that's one major legacy, is that you know, we, we, in a sense, don't look much back to this trial, I think, in large part because every lesson you take from it is now just black letter law. Um, but I think another lesson, too, that was really relevant at the time is it was probably the first like, fair trial, war crimes trial um, where the results surprised people. And I don't think you can have a trial if the result is predictable. That's, I think, almost the definition of a show trial, is that you're having, you know, literally the word trial is a test. Um, and, you know, the Yamashita trial, which I mentioned before, MacArthur kind of rams that through. Yamashita, I should say, is guilty as sin. And I write about that in the book. Um, but his trial is a total sham uh, to the point where MacArthur sees to it that he's convicted and sentenced to death on December 7th, 1945, right? Like, four-year anniversary of, of the attack on Pearl Harbor to dead, right? There's no question that this is politicized justice at its, at its highest level. Um, but here in the Doolittle Raid trial, you have, you know, again, a surprise ending. And, and when you have a surprise, that is a, a measure of fairness um, that we end up seeing in things like Nuremberg, um, right? The Justice Jackson famously said that the test of whether or not these trials be fair is, is not the convictions, it's the acquittals. Um, and, and that's ultimately, I think, uh, probably one of the greater lessons is that it is actually possible to have a fair trial of your enemy in wartime, um, but you have to really commit to doing it. You have to commit to a certain amount of unpredictability as a consequence. Okay, so this brings me to my, my last question, and I'm going to end sort of where we began. You just alluded to the fact that uh, you're involved in the military commissions. Uh, where um, the United States, before uh, a form of military tribunal, quite different, but still a form of military tribunal is uh, seeking to try, among other people, those res uh, allegedly responsible for 9-11. And so I'm just wondering, you know, and it's really remarkable that you went back and kind of dug up the prehistory to these trials in a way. I mean, both the Doolittle Raid trials for the reasons you just said, we talked about Kieran, which is a direct predecessor of these trials. So much has changed, obviously, in the last 70 or 80 years. But I'm just wondering, you know, how long, I don't know how long you took you to write the book, but did, what did lessons did it teach you yeah. or either, either you about what you're doing or about what America's doing in these military commission trials? I mean, what are the larger lessons for that? Um, I think, okay, so I'll, I'll give you two um, that, I, that, come, that come to me on the top of my head. One is, um, like, the personal lessons for me, especially since I've, you know, primarily been assigned to representing Guantanamo details, who... Um, I can tell you, you know, they vary. They're, they're diverse people as all people are. Some of them do not like me, um, even though I'm ostensibly there to help them. Um, and I have to sort of swallow my pride and commit to my role as their advocate, even though um, they're not, <laughs> we're never going to be friends um, and we're never going to come to that piece. And I think working on this book, particularly like studying how the defense lawyers uh, for the Japanese end up having to do their job and, and really put, they end, they end their military careers um, uh, in the course of representing the, the Japanese who are literally some of the most hated people in the world at that point. Um, 
And that kind of just put a certain weight on me to know that even though I'm certainly going to do things that I, I either don't like or unpleasant um, because, you know, I'm doing it for people who, you know, I, I, I'm, I live in New York. I was here on 9-11. I have very specific and personal feelings um, about, about that. And so, you know, dealing with a lot of my clients has always been something of a, com it's a complex relationship, to say the least. And so, but knowing that not only is it like history going to be looking at me the way I was looking at these defense lawyers, but you know, that I know the lesson, right? I have to kind of hold myself to this standard of actually, you know, representing them to the best of my ability, because that's my job and that's my duty. And if I don't do it, it's, it's definitely going to be unfair. Because I think the main reason why the Doolittle rated trial, the Doolittle trial was fair, was the defense lawyers actually took their jobs really seriously. And, and in fact, all the people took their jobs seriously and, and argued really in good faith. So that, that's one big lesson that I, I certainly take is that, you know, even irrespective, irrespective of what you think of your client, it's your job to represent them, no matter the personal or professional reputation costs that might come along with them. Um, the other sort of disturbing lesson is kind of what we were talking about before. I think when I, when I started digging into Japan um, and trying to understand why they did this stuff, uh, to the Doolittle Raiders, you know, especially again with the prejudice of like, well, why didn't they just execute them? Like, that seems like something the Japanese would have done. Um, I, I started seeing this really dark mirror um, of how the United States reacted in a lot of ways in the war on terror. Um, and for a lot of the same reasons, right? Japan, the Doolittle Raid is the first time Japan is attacked in all of recorded history, at least the mainland of Japan is attacked in all of its recorded history. They had a sense of invulnerability of what you might call exceptionalism. And so when the Doolittle Raid happens, um, it shocks the country to its very core. Uh, and they all of a sudden start compromising values that they seem to think they took quite seriously um, only a few months before um, in, in the cause of fear, in the cause of the desire for revenge. And whether or not that's the embrace of things like ex post facto laws and summary trials, um, but also torture, right? Torture, despite, again, my prejudices, I'll, I'll say it was deeply forbidden in Japan. Um, it was actually a major part of their democratic revolution um, in the end of the 1900s was the abolition of torture. It was almost this marquee moment when Japan finally abolishes torture as its moment to enter the, you know, the world as, a, as an equal power along with the United States. Um, it's immediately after that, uh, that the United States actually essentially normalizes relationship, uh, normalizes its relationship with Japan. Um, and so how it could go back on something as foundational to its own identity as the prohibition on torture, uh, which the United States did um, for the very same reasons. <laughs> um, and that, that was just disturbing. That was a disturbing lesson that these norms that we think govern society, even laws that we think govern our behavior are much more fragile uh, when under stress than we tend to want to believe they are. Um, and that's kind of a darker lesson. <laughs> Maybe I should have started with that one. Um, well, that's that, that, that's a dark but perhaps poignant place to stop. Thanks so much. It's a truly great book. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a great conversation.